really for all of our supporters. One of them being our Kona girl, Representative Danae Capella, who was recently elected to our State House of Representatives. So we are so honored um, she is here to guide and steer our canoe today. Uh, she's been a fixture in our community with a vibrant aloha and energy. Uh, born in Kona, raised on a coffee farm, proud graduate of Kona High School. And, um, you know, with her new kuleana, she, she really shares the belief and um, that indigenous cultural practices uh, can pave the way toward a more sustainable use of our precious resources here in Kona. And um, I think it's important that we do bring people from our community together because I really do believe that Kona can serve as a model for other communities as well. You know, we're still learning from, from people who are doing great things, but um, we have a strong community that can also uh, come together and be innovative. So Mahala Nui, Representative Capella for joining us this evening. And I pass it on to you. So exciting. Um, aloha everyone. And thank you so much, Mina. Thank you to the Donkey Mill Art Center for having me and also creating um, just a space for all of us to come together as Mina talked about. I think we have such a rich culture here um, and Kona Coffee plays such a huge role in that. But beyond Kona Coffee, it is the hands that made it possible and the hands that continue to take agriculture and turn it into something that not only sustains people and our communities, but sustains our pathway forward. Um, so I am very honored to be a part of this incredible evening um, and honored to introduce such wonderful um, leaders in our community centered around agriculture and sustainable living. So um, when Mina first approached me, we talked about utilizing the power of art. And for me, I grew up as a dancer and a performing artist and art really shaped, I think, how I thought about the world. Um, and it taught me to question because oftentimes that's really what artists do. They question the world around them. Um, and when we're able to take those two things, art and artists and, and use that as a pathway to, to challenge the systematic structures that we have in place and work together with um, researchers and farmers and people that are working hands-on every single day um, in those fields and use and work together to build that bigger table that we need, that's when incredible things happen. So this is the start of those incredible tables being put together brick by brick and piece of wood by piece of wood um, to create something incredible. So I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I'm not gonna take up any more time because we have incredible panelists that need to speak. Um, so our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Noah Lincoln. He is an associate, re uh, an associate researcher from the University of Hawaii um, where he runs the Interdisciplinary Indigenous Cropping Systems Laboratory. But more importantly, um, Mina talked about him as someone who could do this kind of speech in his sleep. He has lived and breathed um, just the change of working in a modern day restoration efforts, as well as seeking to define the roles of these systems. Um, and you can read all of their bios um, in, the, in the side chat if you want to do so um, in detail. Um, but from um, Dr. Lincoln, we will then go to uh, Nisa Lucero. Um, and she has been an integral part um, for the last 10 years working in agriculture, but also working with the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative. Um, so, she will be wonderful to, to follow up. And then finally, we will also be hearing from uh, Mr. Michael Kramer, who is the uh, president, board president for the West Hawaii Community Kitchen um, and has demonstrated a lifelong commitment to personal and global sustainability. So each of these panelists bring a very unique standpoint um, on sustainable living and sustainable agriculture. Um, and it's sure to be an exciting um, talk story tonight. We also wanna make sure that every single person who is joining us from panelists to our, our wonderful viewers, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box on the side um, and we will, we will tr get to them as soon as we can. So without further ado, we have Dr. Noah Lincoln, who will be sharing his, I think you're sharing, sharing his screen. Um, 
um, and sharing his presentation. So thank you again for joining us, Dr. Lincoln. No problem. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, good to be here. Um, I was sharing in the, you know, organizers chat right before that, that we kind of had a big issue <laughs> arise this week. Um, so I didn't get to prepare uh, specifically for this. So you guys got um, <laughs> one of my class lectures uh, from our graduate seminar, um, which I think will be great. It fits in perfect to what we want to talk about tonight. Um, the only issue is it's a 45 minute presentation in 10 minutes. So we're, if anyone's epileptic, we might be <laughs> clicking through the si slides um, very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, kind of want to just talk about uh, the traditional agricultural landscape here in Kona. Um, as you guys all hopefully know, we're located on the leeward slopes of um, Mauna Loa and Hualalai here. And um, just this context and, you know, start almost all my talks like this, um, it's just to, for us to remember, um, you know, what an amazingly diverse place uh, Hawaii is and that it is, um, you know, ecologically um, considered one of the most um, diverse and ecologically dense places on the planet. Um, and, um, because of that, and because our diversity is also highly organized, um, Hawaii is one of the best living laboratories on the planet for studying um, uh, ecosystem evolution, soil functions, things like that. Um, but it's very relevant to tonight because when our ancestors arrived on these um, landscapes, um, they had to adapt to these very, very different ecologies. And just like a different um, ecosystem supports different um, uh, plants and animals and, and you know, scrubland versus forest and so on, um, the ecosystem also provides certain constraints and certain opportunities for agriculture. Um, so as our ancestors, you know, utilize this landscape um, over time, they developed very place specific um, practices. Uh, that were adapted to the different ecologies of our landscape. Um, and it's arguable um, that because we were the most diverse ecological um, place on the planet, um, our ancestors had the most diverse agricultural practices on the planet. Um, and the more and more we delve into traditional ag, um, you know, the more and more I, I do start to believe that. Um, so the crux of our diversity is really driven by our different age lava flows and the, the large rainfall gradients we hear, have here. Um, those interact to have secondary impacts like the topography of our landscape um, as it evolves over time. Um, our soils change over time, again, with age and rainfall. Um, and again, all these factors kind of interact to, to just create these amazingly diverse uh, opportunities for agriculture um, on our islands. And so Kona um, is no exception, um, although it's, it's not the most impressive uh, ecological gradient in Hawaii, um, it is still very substantial. Um, and, you know, there's many areas in Kona that drop below 600 millimeters of rain down at the coast um, and, you know, kind of in the wettest areas before rainfall declines further upslope, you know, we max out at about 2200. Um, so, you know, that's still a fourfold uh, change in rainfall and that's very substantial as to how it's driven um, soil development and, and ecological um, evolution over, over its history. And so again, our ancestors adapted to this ecology that existed across the slopes and Kona in particular um, benefited as being one of the central locations of early um, contact with, with Europeans and Americans. And because of that, um, our understanding, you know, the, the written description um, of agriculture in Kona um, is, is considerably richer than most places. Um, and so this uh, agroecology or these different applications of ag across the landscape are very well recorded here. Um, and so starting at the coast, the Kahakai, um, where you kind of had a, a fairly barren landscape in that sea spray zone, um, that would give way to these lowland plains um, called the Kula. 
uh, and those are generally quite dry, um, much more home to uh, resource crops, um, things like peely grass, hala, um, coconut, uh, ipu gourds. Um, and so things that one could handle um, the dry landscape, but also things that you weren't heavily reliant on for food. Um, so if you have a dry year um, and everything dies in the Kula zone, um, you know, your food supply is still nicely intact. Um, as you moved upslope from there, you got into a, a agroforestry system um, based on a breadfruit canopy um, uh, referred to as the Kalu'ulu. Um, and this was a, a narrow band, um, only about a half mile wide on the landscape, but stretched continuously across the landscape. Um, and then above the Kalu'ulu, you had the Apa'a, um, and this was really the intensively farmed uh, zone, uh, the place where you invested the most in terms of infrastructure. So there's a lot of rock work in the Apa'a um, where they were clearing fields um, and creating rock features for planting. Um, and this is where the bulk of the kind of um, annual staple crops were grown, things like kalo, uwala, um, maia, uhi, uh, things like that. And then finally, um, you had the Ama'u zone. Um, in which you still had a, a mostly intact native forest um, and a preserved native canopy. Uh, but under that native canopy, you were, you were um, clearing the understory, um, planting things like bananas and yams, um, kind of things that required less maintenance um, and are more persistent on their own. Um, and in particular, the Ama'u really served as kind of a, a reserve production. Um, you could go up there, plant maia, uhi, things like that, and, and just leave them. Um, and then when the big drought hits in 10, 20 years, um, you can go up to the ama'u and have these reserve production supplies um, persisting in the forest. Um, so yeah, just to kind of quickly give you a, a little look at some of these. Um, so again, the apa'a zone, um, extremely intensive uh, production. Uh, this is an archaeological map of um, Kahalu'u, basically straight Malka from Donkey Mill um, up on Kamehameha School's lands. Um, buried under regrowth forest is this amazingly dense um, preserved archaeological section of uh, traditional ag. Um, so kind of dominated by these long walls um, that are referred to as Kua'ivi. Uh, but then a whole range of, of infrastructure in here, um, including Awai. Um, so there are areas in our Kona landscape, particularly on our Pohoihoi flows, um, where we do get seasonal ponding and runoff. Um, and there are features in these systems that clearly show um, there are small areas where our ancestors were doing wetland kalo in Kona. Um, even though we think of Kona as exclusively um, dry land. Um, and here's what it looks like from Google Earth. Um, this is uh, up on the top of Judd Trail. Um, uh, and yeah, again, just zooming in, you know, this is all buried under grass, but um, with a bird's eye view, again, you could just see the intensity of this infrastructure that was built um, uh, for our ancestors' agriculture. Um, and again, the diversity, you know, dominated by the walls, but in this upper right, you can see um, these dots are, are all um, stone planting mounds. Um, you get areas like this that are corralling water um, into enclosures. Um, so yeah, re very micro um, scale uh, as far as the adaptation. Um, and yeah, really quite amazing. Um, and this is just a picture of, of one of those walls um, at the Amy Greenwell Ethnobotanical Garden. Um, so the upper half of that garden is a, a preserve of the Apa'a zone as well. So you can see some of this infrastructure um, uh, without trespassing. <laughs> um, and just to highlight, you know, some of the kind of work we've been doing in this zone, um, one of our big questions about traditional rain-fed agriculture is how um, our ancestors preserve nitrogen. And so we've done a lot of work looking at um, nitrogen dynamics and nitrogen fixation around our crops and systems. 
I'm really going to speed up. I'm almost out of time. Uh, so the Kalaulu, um, again, um, this is a beautiful depiction of that, where you can see that breadfruit belt um, drawn across the Kona landscape. Um, this was drawn by one of the missionary's daughters from Kailua, um, looking back slope. Um, and we used um, this drawing and maps. Um, oh, sorry, this is uh, um, our effort at restoring it in South Kona. Um, but we took a lot of these old maps and drawings, and um, we also ran up and down the mountain a whole bunch of times, mapping all these old breadfruit trees um, to understand, to recreate the extent of that Kalaulu and really understand where it was situated on the landscape. Um, and there was a lot of really, really cool things about um, exactly where it is that we don't have time to go into. Um, but I will say that um, because it always gets asked, the old Mamalohoa Highway is a very, very good predictor of the upper edge, the Mauka edge of the breadfruit zone. So when you're driving on the Mamalahoa, basically everything Makai was, was breadfruit um, and everything Mauka was the apaa, the, the kind of kalo cultivation. Um, we did a bunch of yield work. This system was incredibly productive um, on the order of about 18,000 tons of breadfruit produced a year. Um, that's 36 million pounds of, of breadfruit. Um, for scale, we import about 50 million pounds of potatoes uh, today. So um, if we turned all of Kona coffee back into breadfruit, we would you know, replace about three quarters of our potato imports. Um, and then the Kula, this lowland zone um, is really, really interesting. Again, much drier, um, much more uh, taking advantage of little opportunities here and there. So you know formalized infrastructure, no formalized wall, but every little depression, every little low point or undulation in the land where you got a little bit of moisture accumulation, um, they would take advantage of and, and build infrastructure on. Um, and again, when you look at these landscapes today, this is Kohala, but it's similar to, to what we see in Kona. Um, they're so desolate <laughs> and it's amazing to imagine um, growth in here, but you read some of these early European descriptions and they were amazed. You know, they talk about just these dry, scraggly, rocky landscapes with these big, lush sweet potatoes, you know, pouring out of these rock mounds. Um, and again, some of this infrastructure is amazingly cool. <laughs> you know, like you're out on a Pohoihoi flow and there's one little crack in the Pohoihoi and they mound up rocks and they preserve that soil and they'll be cropping, you know, in this little area. Um, really amazing. This is down near um, Kalai Mano. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just gonna wrap it up there. Um, our ancestors adapted all sorts of these agricultural forms to all sorts of different ecosystems. Um, and we've been trying to understand that. Um, and again, use Hawaii as a model system um, because we have such amazing diversity. And again, that diversity is very well organized um, and we can actually understand um, really quite well um, what our ancestors were doing and why um, and do things like this and, and you know, model exactly, um, yeah, where they were doing what. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, stop talking and um, turn the mic back over. Oh my goodness. I was furiously taking notes. I don't know if anyone else was doing that as well. Um, but thank you so, so much. I, there's a question in here that I'm actually very curious about as well from Antu. Um, and in Kona specifically, um, is the Mamalahoa run through the middle, right through the middle of um, Kalu'ulu? Uh, no, so it's right along the Mauka boundary. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's the middle of the, the whole field system, um, but then that field system's cut up into zones. And so, yeah, the Mamalahoa, um, the old Mamalahoa kind of runs right on that boundary between the Kalaulu and the Apaa zone. And I, my theory, and I have no evidence at all to support this yet, um, but, uh, you know, the Apaa is the major ag zone. So you're doing most of your work and your labor every day. And, um, you know, you probably want to cross slope trail up there, right, to get across the landscape. And if you're gonna do that, you would wanna walk in the shade of the breadfruit trees and not out in the open in your callow fields. 
Um, but you don't want to go way down slope and walk across, you know, you want it as high up as you can, but still be in the shade of the breadfruit. And then, so my idea was you had a cross slope trail there that became a donkey trail that became a carriage trail that became a road that became the Mamalahoa Highway. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question that I want to ask uh, specifically relating to all of the historical knowledge that you have. Um, and it's, I guess, in your view, um, what is the most undervalued and underutilized farming practice, method, or tradition of our kupuna that we could implement today? Uh-huh. Um, I mean, the biggest one, I think, is the large-scale, you know, adaptation, right? That, um, you know, in, in Hawaiian thinking, um, you know, in most indigenous cultures that have, you know, not only a kinship, but actually a subservient perspective, right, of the relationship between humans and nature, um, which I would argue is, is literally the opposite of, of Western culture that, you know, for instance, in the Bible, right, literally it's a dominion of man over nature. And so I think there's deeply ingrained, right, um, differences in, in how we see our, our interaction with the environment. Um, but, um, you know, as we see the adaption of agricultural form at a large scale, uh, you know, it's much more working within the um, ecological limits of the land. You know, it acknowledges that the land um, does have a will of its own to some degree. And from a scientific perspective, that's true too, right? Um, you know, different landscapes just behave differently. Um, and I feel that our, our ancestors' agriculture um, just acknowledged that very well. And so if a place didn't want to grow intensive kalo, right, they didn't force it to. Um, they, they developed a different system that might have emphasized a different crop that, um, that worked better with the, the landscape. And I think um, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained in, in that. Um, you know, I'm not saying to abandon modern practices by any means, but um, we could do those modern practices again much better, you know, if we were smart about it. Um, you know, and for instance, um, I hope I don't piss anyone off with this, but, you know, since we're thinking about like the coffee landscape of Kona, um, you know, Kona soils are, um, our young soils are governed by a whole different realm of, of fertility. Um, we have these large soil grains that just don't hold nutrients. Um, so when we go out there and we fertilize, um, like our fertilizer use efficiency in Kona um, has got to be pathetic. You know, I mean, I've never seen a study on it, but our soils don't retain nutrients. And so every time we go out there and throw all these fertilizers on, you know, like 10 to 20% maybe is getting to the plant and, you know, the rest of it's washing out down to our oceans eventually. Um, in these young soils, um, you know, they're, they're, and I, Actually, if I continued the talk, this is what is in there, and there's a whole bunch of soil data. Um, you know, uh, they're extremely responsive to organic matter. Um, like 80% of the exchange capacity of Kona soils is associated with organic matter. So, on these young rocky soils, you really want carbon, you know, and so you want to be growing trees that are putting down lots of, of mulch and leaf litter. And that increases the retention of our soils. And now if we go out and throw fertilizer, 80% um, of it might stick around in the soil and make it to that tree and, and lose a lot less. And you know, these practices are being reborn or rebranded in a whole range of new disciplines, right? Agroecology and syntropic farming and um, regenerative ag, you know, and all of these things. Um, from my perspective, are really just repackaging indigenous agricultural practices that have been around for millennia. Um, but they are doing it in a way that, you know, is more accepted by, by 
um, the Western science and the, you know, commercial ag. And so they're, they're making headway and that's good. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's anything new, you know. Okay. Wow. I'm learning so much. I hope everyone out there is learning as much as I am as well. Um, before it gets too dark, I think we're going to jump to um, Anissa, um, since she's outside using the natural sunlight. Um, so would you, I think we're going to do a screen sharing for Anissa as well. Um, and then once again, for everyone who's watching it and joining us on Facebook um, and here on our Zoom, Anissa is with um, the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative. And she's going to be sharing with us a little bit more. Um, she works in their manufacturing operations um, as and many other things from product development to e-commerce sales and marketing and social media. So I'm very excited to hear everything you have to say. Anissa, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you, Janae, for the introduction. Yeah, um, I'm here at uh, Malakalu Ulu Farm, and we're located in Ahua Pua'a, Ka. A. Um, and Malakalu Ulu is a farm that Noah and his wife, Donna, um, started. Uh, via business plan for the Mahi Matcha back in 2015. And so during that time in 2015, um, I was actually really interested in Ulu and was doing a local farmer training, um, you know, rancher program with the Kohala Center. And I just became fascinated with breadfruit um, really for its ability to produce food um, as well as uh, having this, um, this sustainability factor, right? And not only that, like I, I picked up uh, Noah's paper on uh, Hawaiian native plants and I learned about the canoe crops. And for me, like being, you know, somebody, um, you know, young adult, <laughs> really interested in permaculture, um, it was fascinating to me that the ancient Hawaiians they brought over the 27 canoe plants that sustained their life here on island with, you know, very little um, native plants that were growing, maybe some shrubs and, you know, their um, berries and things like that. But they really brought their own sustenance and building material. Um, and so Ulu was one of those and was uh, one of the four major um, staple starches along with my uh, banana, uwala, sweet potato, kalo, or taro. Um, and I, I lived in South Kona um, pretty much, you know, for, for the whole time. I've been here 10 years just for a little, little backstory. And I started off lettuce farming <laughs> um, at Kela Ola Lettuce Farm right under, um, right under the community hospital. And so, you know, they had soil there, but you know, you look everywhere else and it's very rocky. Um, so like planting annuals in, in South Kona didn't really quite make sense to me. Um, and at the time coffee was experiencing um, the coffee beetle borer, um, which just, you know, created a tremendous stress on coffee farmers, you know, having to spray, you know, five times or so, you know, given a season um, and just increase the maintenance and then, um, you know, decrease in, in production. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, well, Ulu, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and everywhere I turned at that time in, in 2014 and 15, um, you know, even a lot of my mentors, they were like, uh, yeah, Ulu, <laughs> you know, maybe not, you know, Ulu flour is, is very expensive um, to produce, which it is, you know, the cost of labor and um, cost of the good itself or, or the fruit, um, you know, is something like, like $12 a pound, which is just no comparison to regular wheat flour, which is, you know, a dollar something a pound. Um, so I kept coming into these sort of roadblocks of like, okay, if I want to be a ulu farmer, where am I going to go? And um, actually my mentor at the time at Kuhua Aina in um, Hamakua, or excuse me, Honaka'a, um, with the Kohala Center Farm, they um, knew about Donna and Noah and actually connected with me, connected them 
um, to me uh, in 2016. And so that's when I joined on. And so um, Malakalu Ulu, which is the farm that I'm at right now, you can see the Ulu trees in this area, the one um, right behind me, um, that one is uh, four years old. And so the trees are just, you know, growing and um, starting to bear fruit. But so that summer 2016 that I um, joined in with Malakalu Ulu, um, Donna had, um, you know, created the idea to do the larger cooperative. Um, and so MKC has kind of been the impetus for the larger co-op, which is known as um, Hawaii Ulu Cooperative or HUC. And so um, that summer we met in um, Waimea actually with um, I believe 20 farmers showed up at the initial meeting to, um, you know, see who might be interested in jumping on board with this Ulu co-op and 12 farmers signed on and luckily it was, you know, the season of, of Ulu and, um, you know, people's trees were fruiting. And we started out out of um, Sweet Can Cane Cafe's kitchen uh, over in Hilo and Jackie Prell and um, Ginger John or John Caverly, um, they opened up their um, certified kitchen to the Ulu Co-op and were processor members and um, farmers started to bring in the fruit. And so with the cooperative model, it's the farmers that own the business and based upon their patronage or how much they use the, the co-op, um, they receive uh, you know, uh, dividends um, at the end of the year on how much fruit that they bring in. Um, and so that first year, we ended up processing 12,000 to 18,000 pounds of breadfruit. And, you know, Donna was like, oh my gosh, like, what are we going to do? We have so much ulu. And so she actually went out from, um, you know, went out to the hotels and to the restaurants and brought samples of ulu and was really trying to market it. And at that time, there really wasn't a market for Ulu. And if so, it, it was pretty small. And a lot of folks, they already had access to fresh fruit. Um, and so, you know, in that case, they were using it. Um, and so kind of, you know, to step back a little bit um, about, you know, what the Hawaii Ulu Co-op um, does and kind of like what, um, what product that I'm referring to, it's our minimally processed uh, steamed and frozen Ulu. So, you know, bringing this new product of steamed and frozen ulu to restaurants was, um, was a new thing. And so eventually, as it started to catch on, we started to sell out of fruit, <laughs> out of our product. And so it was just this, you know, supply and demand where it was like, okay, we had too much supply. And then it was like, oh, okay, like, now we have too much demand. And so um, there were times where it's like, oh, we need more ulu and, um, you know, when before our trees were really going off or we had you know more farmers um like currently we have 85 farmers that belong to the co-op um but in that first year you know we only started out with 12. um and so we were trying to get access to more fruit and so i would actually go around the neighborhood um in my little pickup truck and you know go to uh the trees nearby and um ask ask property owners if i could harvest their fruit um, and it's pretty neat, like even with, uh, you know, Noah's work with the Kalu Ulu, a lot of the trees that I visited um, to do these harvests were um, Hawaii a Hawaiian variety. And, you know, very likely the descendants from that um, ancient Kalu Ulu belt um, here in Hawaii. Um, so jumping forward, we in 2017, um, we opened up the Hanalo Marshalling Yard in Kona. And at the time, the food basket um, director was very supportive of um, what the co-op was doing and um, loved Ulu. And so allowed us to come in and build a certified kitchen. Um, and so 
that certified kitchen it was pretty small um but you know we opened up we opened our doors and you know another uli season came on and farmers started bringing their fruit and at the time um, I was the operations manager so it was really exciting um, very stressful at times <laughs> to um, you know just see all of the fruit come in and so in that year when we opened up in 2017 at the Hanalo Marshalling Yard we processed um, 42,000 pounds of breadfruit and it was incredibly challenging like every night it was just like oh my gosh how are we going to get through this fruit and you know we were racing time um, as ulu ripens very quickly um, it can have a you know <laughs> one one to five day shelf life to where the ulu changes from firm to to soft um, and so that has actually been one of our greatest challenges is um, having the infrastructure to process all of the agri all of the fruit. Um, and so in 2018, uh, we processed uh, 72,000 pounds and we started uh, diving into some co-crops. We did some co-crop testing. We did um, luau and papaya, um, banana, um, and you know now we're jumping into kalo and uh, we did sweet potato. So we were kind of testing out you know this co-crop idea. And so the thing with ulu is it has um, you know this this sort of uh, peak season where it's um, you know, we it, it's it's peak season is in the summer, and then also in the late fall. And when that happens, we get about two thirds of all of our fruit within a two month period. And so, as you can imagine, we're getting you know up to you know twenty thousand um, pounds in a given month, um, which is just it was very very challenging to get through. Um, and so now you know, 2019, we've like gained a really solid crew and, you know, people who are really dedicated to our mission and, um, you know, the work that we're doing. And so they've been putting in longer hours, um, you know, just to get through the agricultural products, right? Um, because, you know, time happens and it can, it can go bad. Um, and so also like having a flexible team that has been like on the forefront of creating the market and you know at the time like you know within the past three years um it was us really working with distributors um you know a few people who we would sell to at wholesale you know um and then they would sell to restaurants and hotels or you know um, a distributor that would sell and distribute to the hawaii public schools and so you know getting those that those first uh really large orders of ulu through the doe were very challenging and um was very challenging and required us to to really step it up and um you know just try to try to meet the goal um, and so now this year with COVID, trying to wrap up here. <laughs> um, so this year with COVID, you know, we've, we pretty much, you know, prior to April, we had basically no online sales. Um, and, you know, we were just getting into grocery stores. We had a, um, a value added product hummus and, um, you know, we just got our, our 12 ounce retail pack. Um, into the groceries and um, we really hadn't been connected to um, the everyday user or to the home home cooks and um, that has been a huge pivot for us and something that you know we really value and see as as our way to be resilient and in stepping into the future is having a diverse market um, we relied so heavily on food service that um, we didn't really have a chance to think about our home user audience. And so this year we've really upped our e-commerce um, 
our e-commerce, uh, online sales, and you know, reaching um, consumers at home. Um, so now we have an online store that's been updated and is a little is more easy, user friendly. And we're constantly working to you know increase brand awareness and you know people to actually consider eating ulu and you know take action and buying and cooking and eating ulu and then of course like you know being loyal to where they're like oh my gosh like you got to try this ulu it's so good like you got to know about hawaii ulu co-op and you know all of their awesome products um and so you know stepping into like this diversity um strategy or it's it's like to be to be diverse utilizing co-crops within our production meaning we have um you know crops like kalo sweet potato um and squash to fulfill you know the kind of missing gaps where ulu isn't in production so that our employees can you know have work reliable work all year round um but also to diversify our market and then, you know, having this diversity of like wholesale product for food services, and then also, you know, being able to reach the home user, you know, via grocery stores or um, online sales. And so, you know, like as far as how people can support, um, you know, the movement, you know, it's like, yes, um, you know, support your local businesses, That's, that'll help us be more sustainable um, and also, you know, consume more local starches. Um, you know, we pretty much don't produce any of our own starch and we import about 100% of it um, that really we can make an impact in our own food security by choosing local starches. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of sums it up for me. I don't want to take too much of the time here. Um, so I'll hand it over or I can answer some questions. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anissa. Um, just hearing the story, I think, of how the Hawaii Ulu Co-op came to be um, and just the different layers of the organization and how you folks are forming now is, is so amazing to hear. Um, and then just also being reminded of how important it is to, I guess, to buy our own local starches, as you were talking about. Oftentimes, I think even myself, I am um, very guilty of going to the store and and purchasing a package of potatoes there. Um, I do like to use farmers markets, but it's so wonderful to now have the Hawaii Ulu Co-op and um, noticing that you folks do reach many different generations of people, especially through your social media and your different platforms there. Um, and then the cross marketing from different uh, different stores and restaurants that you folks sell in. Um, I know that everyone here has probably had uh, Ulu wedges from like Magic's Grill and all of these other local restaurants that we that we love. Um, but I, I did have a question. Um, and I think you might have touched on this. Um, but what are some of the challenges that farmers, vendors and consumers and Kona specifically? I'm sorry, I just missed your last part. So what is the challenges that farmers, vendors, Absolutely. and consumers? And consumers face uh, that prevent have and Kona specifically from being more sustainable? Uh, I see. Um, what prevents farmers from being more sustainable is not having um, a market to sell their produce that they would produce um you know if a farmer's um a bunch of squash you know and and these local foods you know having somewhere that they can depend on um you know is important and and would you know of course support that su sustainability like through the food chain um and you know for for processors the biggest challenge that we face is um having the the infrastructure um and and um you know ability to process so um in the future you know or not even in the future but we are working towards mechanizing um our our process so that it can be more um you know cost accessible 
um, <laughs> more accessible uh, by lowering the cost of the, the product. Right now, we're really like as low as we can go as far as margin wise that are viable. Um, and so by, you know, having this sort of economy of scale where we've we've increased production and, and we um, have mechanization and um, we can provide a lower price, there opens the door for um, the consumers to participate in a more sustainable um, culture um, and a more sustainable, um, you know, just, just choices, um, you know, for, for their diet or, you know, for their groceries that they buy. Um, so I, I hope I answered all your, all of that there. Yeah, um, I disappeared for a second because I have very unstable internet apparently in my little South Kona home. Um, <laughs> but, but thank you for answering that. And thank you for, for talking about, I think just some of the different challenges that, that we're facing. Um, one more question on sustainability, I think, and I guess, especially for you folks, you touched on this uh, when you were when you were doing your presentation. But you also talked about how how you how you've changed um, just because of COVID nineteen and how that impacted and affected the way you folks do do your business, um, shifting to a more e commerce um, and and I guess internet driven way of of moving. And there were farmers markets that did the same thing. And um, so I guess my question would be. What were, what were the actions that you folks had taken um, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic um, in, in regards to food security um, and agriculture that you think we need to continue or even move to a statewide platform moving forward as we recover from the pandemic? Mm -hmm. um, so actions that we took following the pandemic, you know, luckily there was funds available for um, technical assistance and we actually hopped on a workshop for e-commerce sales which was um, something that uh, was presented as a um, as as a, a as a solution or you know one of the ways that we could stay resilient in in the time of COVID where people weren't um, going out to stores and so it was specifically um, for a manufacturers um, and you know us as a food manufacturer participated um, so you know the e-commerce like we don't foresee that you know being uh, our, our main market um, although you know we would hope that we can increase it to about 20 percent of um, our total market one of the other um, aspects of you know what has happened and you know um, resources that were were funneled in um, was the the cares uh, cares grants and you know these uh, community feeding programs that supported us as well during that time because you know once the um, you know once COVID hit we had you know basically. 50% of our product going to the Department of Education. And, you know, the other 50 was uh, large food dis distributors. And so with, you know, the schools closed and the restaurants closed, the DOE basically folding or closing their um, farm to school program, um, you know, for that interim, then, um, you know, we, we were sitting on thousands of pounds of fruit. And so, you know, having that, um, you know, that, that support of, you know, purchasing local uh, for community feeding programs was really helpful. And so, you know, having something like that continue or having the, the additional support for community, but also for businesses, right? So if, um, you know, small businesses were able to uh, receive access to resources to, to be able to continue um, their operations and also be helpful. Okay, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I think you're on mute, Janae. Okay, thank you so 
much, Anissa. Thank you for sharing about the Hawaii Ulu Co-op. Uh, uh, I was just talking about, I hear cokey frogs and I'm about to start hearing them at my home as well um, as the sun goes down. Um, another fixture right here in, in South Kona um, and, and in Hulola. Um, but last but not least, we are gonna be moving to Mr. Michael Kramer. Um, and I'm not sure, I think he also has a slide um, that he will be sharing with us um, and talking about just some of the innovative things um, that we are now moving towards and the incredible kitchen that we have um, to help sustain uh, local farmers here. So without further ado, here we go. Thanks so much, Janae, appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on this. Uh, as I'm sure you know, we have 700 farms in, in West Hawaii. And one of the big uh, economic diversification drivers for agricultural communities is the ability to create products from what they grow. And we don't actually have a, a publicly available commercial kitchen, if you can believe it, in this community. You have to either use a church or find, make some special arrangements with a business that already has one but one that exists for the benefit of the community has been needed for quite some time. And about six, seven years ago, a bunch of us decided we needed to do something about that. And so uh, we started to uh, develop a concept and start raising some money. And uh, this uh, effort is a, is a whole community effort. And, the, and we were very fortunate that the legislature got involved and, and funded this twice uh, to get us going in 2015 and 2018 from grants in aid from the legislature. And so we have successfully uh, raised uh, a lot of money and have actually built the kitchen. It's 80% it's done. It's not quite done, but it is very exciting. It's the West Hawaii Community Kitchen and it sits above the hospital uh, in the Kana Wewe Ahupua'a. And uh, so it's a project of Kua O Kana Weiwe, which is our nonprofit. And the kitchen, once finished, will be available to the entire uh, community to rent, uh, to produce all kinds of things. And I'm going to show you a picture because it exists. Right, like a few hundred yards above the hospital, is this is sitting uh, up there, already built. And the exterior is completed. Uh, what remains is the interior. We actually have all of the equipment, um, but uh, the interior still needs to be finished. So we're still raising about three hundred thousand dollars. We've raised one point seven million so far. It's been incredibly successful uh, campaign so far, and we were able to get it to this point. And we envision uh, it being used for all kinds of value-added products. You know, you can pretty much make make anything uh, dried and leathered and sauced and salsas, salsaed from uh, and, and fermented from anything that's grown around here. And so uh, there's dozens and dozens of, of products that can be made from, from raw produce. Uh, about six, seven years ago, we did a, a engagement with the community to try to figure out what the priorities were. We, we did market research with 150 farmers in the region. We know what kinds of equipment uh, they want, what kinds of products they want to produce. And we went and made our purchasing with that in mind. Uh, I'll just share another floor plan of the kitchen. It's actually two side by side. Boy, that's not right. Let's try that again. How's that? So you can see it's two side by side kitchens dry goods storage and a walk-in cooler and a walk-in freezer, uh, a few, three offices and a huge open meeting room for classes. We envision this being a, uh, a training uh, facility for, for chefs and for farmers in health standards and, and, and really, you know, it can be a real full service uh, enterprise to really help people be effective uh, rather than just renting space. So uh, we, we see this as being a tremendous community resource and um, it's large, it's a 2,800 square foot building and, uh, and with a parking area. So it's all very exciting. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity, I think, for this community. We are still in fundraising mode and you know, it's, it's challenging to raise money right now given the, the sort of very pressing food security needs and the philanthropic community is obviously very dedicated to helping people in need, which is huge. Food security is a major issue right now. 
But this infrastructure will be a major piece of really helping uh, develop the local economy. And it's really going to be uh, widely used. We're anticipating, you know, 24 seven use, you know, once it's really going. And uh, so we've been kind of quiet and under the radar. So I really appreciate this opportunity to share the story and tell people about it. Uh, we do have a West Hawaii Community Kitchen.com website. If you, if you want to get in touch, your West Hawaii Community Kitchen at gmail.com is a way that you can, you know, get in touch with us. Uh, but stay tuned because as our fundraising uh, continues, we do expect to finish this and, and get it uh, and get it used. It's, it's too bad it couldn't be used right this minute. But, you know, fundraising is fundraising and, and we do the best that we can. And it's, it's amazing that the legislature uh, cared enough about this community to even allocate that kind of money for this kind of purpose. Uh, so a big mahalo to them for, uh, and it wasn't just the Kona people, they obviously advocated on our behalf, but uh, the entire state uh, got behind this because of the need for our hundreds of farmers. So I'll just stop there. That's a very basic uh, overview and I'm sensitive to the time, but I'm certainly willing to uh, take any questions. Michael, this is so impressive. And in all of the comments um, and in the chat, so many people are chiming in about just how much value this truly does add to our community. Um, so thank you. And this also shows how important it is when, when just a small group of people have a really incredible idea and they come together and they work so hard to put something together like this and it happens. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your dedication um, and to all of the folks working with you. It's truly, truly beautiful. And I, I too am so impressed and so grateful that it's right here um, in our small South Kona community. Um, I, I did have a question on when do you folks anticipate the um, opening, I guess? I, it's hard to talk about with, with, the pos with COVID looming, but um, do you folks have a, a, a target date in mind? No, because it all it depends on our capacity to raise the money. We have several grant proposals outstanding. We're, we're anxiously awaiting the results. If we get the money that we've asked for, we can, you know, start construction up again and, and be done within a few months. We're only about three months worth of construction time needed to actually be finished, but we have to have the money in place first. So I can't really say with any uh, certainty uh, you know, what exactly the timeline is. It's already late from my perspective. We had hoped to have this finished already, but you know, when you're asking for money, they have the right to say no and foundations uh, get asked for a lot and they can't always give you what you ask for. So that's life and we're patient and persistent and we'll just see how it goes. That patient and persistent um, and dedication is, is really the thing I think that, that helps shift world change for so many people. So, so thank you for that. And, and thank you for sharing. I think so many people, as you said, you folks have been under the radar for so long and myself included, it was, it's so amazing to be able to see something like this being built. Um, so hopefully we can all hooey together um, and help with the fundraising efforts. Um, so I guess maybe we'll shift to some, to some group questions. And if any of our panelists would like to uh, jump on um, and, and answer some of these questions, or if you all want to chime in, um, please do so. There's a question so, from William in the chat about who it's dedicated to. And what I would say, it's dedicated to anybody who wants to use it. it, it, it we were assuming farmers and, and chefs would be the primary users, but it's gonna be wide open to anybody who wants to go into business for themselves and develop products. Uh, it's gonna, we're not gonna necessarily be picking and choosing. It's really going to be first come, first serve, and, and wherever the, the need really is, it'll be determined by the, the demand. That's fantastic. Um, I guess that brings me to a question about the DOE and the Department of Education um, and education as a whole. I know you talked about the, um, there's a section um, in, the, in the building, in the community kitchen that is dedicated to, towards education um, and learning. Do you folks do you folks have um, any specific goals in mind when it comes to, I guess, working with some of our local schools um, and, and maybe helping to, I guess, allow some of our, our youth to participate in that as well and to participate in the possibility of um, what this kitchen brings to our community? 
Yeah, it's completely wide open. It's an educational space. It can be used for teaching and training and cooking classes. And, you know, it can really be used for anything. Uh, and we're, we're first just trying to get it built, but, you know, I think that it's completely wide open and we really want to see where the interest lies. What do people want, you know, um, and, and be responsive. It really, because it's a nonprofit venture, I mean, it does have to be self-sustaining in the sense that the, the hourly rental fees will help sustain it. But uh, we really want it to be a community resource that is determined by the community in terms of what they what the community wants. So we're, we're trying to we have soft ideas, not hard ideas, and we're not going to be attached to them because we want to see who shows up and who's really interested and, and, and see how we can best be of service to the community. Fantastic. One of the most beautiful things that I see with this is that we often talk about um, see to table or farm to table foods, but this is an opportunity that really allows um, farmers to take control of that and, and not just um, selling their, 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 their farmed product, but um, something that they've created on top of that. So that value added um, opportunity is, is really incredible. So, so thank you. Um, That's actually where the money is. The money is in, the profit margin is in when you turn that raw product into something. That's where the farmers can really make more money. So that's the goal here is to increase the standard of living for, for anybody who wants to, to make these value added products. It doesn't guarantee them a market. Of course, there's a lot of work involved in distributing your products once you've made them. But uh, that's the goal here is, is real economic development. Fantastic. We definitely need that, especially as we talk about sustainability and sustainable agriculture as the heartbeat of this economic recovery coming back from COVID. So it's incredible to have a resource like that here in our community. Um, I, I, I guess I want to touch a little bit on education for um, uh, for all of our panelists. But how can Hawaii's education system play a role in the develop in the development of sustainable agriculture and food systems here for our islands? And I'll open the floor to any of our three panelists. Developing or enriching the farm to school program, um, which would allow for schools to be able to um, purchase uh, local foods, um, local products, and you know to be able to support farmers. Um, also, more uh, educational materials on you know, the, the various local crops that um, the students, you know, might be getting at the school. Thank you. Um, it's also really interesting when you when you talk about uh, making more educational resources available for students at our local schools, we, especially for me, I, just coming out of, well, not just coming out of, but um, when I, when I think about my time in, in high school, we didn't often get real hands-on opportunities to learn or work with farmers or understand more about our Hawaiian history and how that plays into um, who we are today. Um, and there's so much knowledge I think that can be taken from understanding where we come from. And Noah talked a lot about that, um, just that, that history that we have and how indigenous and, and native cultures have worked and, and really valued our land. Um, so I guess that leads me to one of our last questions, um, but what does a sustainable food system here in Hawaii look like and how do we get there? Well, it's, it's substituting for imports. That's I'm sure what everybody would agree. The more we, and that's been brought up several times by different people today, the less we import, the better. And so which means we have to substitute for that, but with our production. So it, it almost requires coordination amongst all the farmers to, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the retailers and the buyers to figure out a way to guarantee a market. Because right now people have to ship things off at commodity prices in order to make it worth their while. And so how do we uh, create a, an economic incentive for people to sell locally? Well, people have to commit to buying local and that includes all the, the grocery stores. They do little bits and pieces, but they don't do enough. And I don't think that the, uh, I don't think that it's all very coordinated. So I'd love to see that. To me, the economic development agencies on this island have really dropped the ball on this and they really need to step up. Yeah. 
it's it's exactly what you were talking about. It's it's difficult to acknowledge, and it's very sad um, that that's that that's really what's happened. Um, but I, th I think for me, I draw so much hope from organizations like your own um, and the research of Dr. Lincoln um, and the the um, the the incredible um, market um, that the Hawaii Ula Co-op has created. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we need legislators and leaders in our communities that will help support those farmers um, and, and those businesses to help really shift where we draw our economic um, opportunities from. So I think one of my uh, last questions would also be coming back here to Kona and, and centering back here in Kona, um, with Kona being such an important area for intense cultivation. And I think so many people have talked about um, have talked about just specifically that and and how Kona really has been such a breadbasket um, for our state. But how can we, with such an, and sorry, with Kona being such an important area of intense cultivation, how can we tap into that abundance once again? Come on, Noah, you got that one. I know, I'm like, Dr. Just, just do it, just, just do it. <laughs> um art i think art's the answer we need um, Good answer. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah i mean it's a hard answer because um you know as i think kind of got illuminated in in both you know anisa's stories and and michael's um you know discussion uh there's so many issues you know, there's not one bottleneck right now. Um, you know, everything from the production side of land access and water access to the, you know, infrastructure and markets and consumer preferences and transportation and, you know, cold storage integrity across the state. And I mean, there's just, there's so many things, um, you know, and I think the work of the Ulu Co-op um, uh, you know, me kind of following along with the, the work of the Ulu Co-op has really illuminated that for me, you know, and the diversity of activities they're doing, you know, developing educational kits for schools and partnering with, you know, the food baskets and community food and, you know, developing new infrastructure and they've had to build new kitchens and, you know, you know, invent new equipment that doesn't even exist for breadfruit and like they're, they're, it for them you know their story is just like one constant hurtling um you know just rotating from one bottleneck to the next um constantly to try to you know alleviate the pressure and raise everything um so yeah i mean these questions to me are really difficult to give any one answer because it is it's a whole system of change you know so i mean what you need is um you know, a lot of motivated and, and you know, um, well-trained people, you know, attacking all different parts of the system um, so that everybody can grow together. And, you know, I do think, you know, a key part of that, um, that again, the co-op has done really well is the relationship building, um, you know, so having good interaction with, with your community and with your politicians and with your businesses. So when you, you know, need to make these connections happen in the system, um, you can make them happen because you know who to who to talk to and they know what you're doing. And um, But yeah, no, there's certainly no silver bullet, you know, in my um, mind. Um, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's been another part of the co-op journey is constantly realizing there's no silver bullet. <laughs> <laughs> we're always like we're gonna we're gonna solve it and then like no it's it's not it's just <laughs> um, yeah one tiny piece of of a huge puzzle right that that we all need to work on together and to add to that i would say um a culture of sustainability and a commitment to sustainability and i feel like you know, had we not had committed employees um, that were, you know, believed in the sustainability aspect of ULU, um, you know, we might not be where we are today. 
And, you know, part of that was kind of like, okay, you know, like I kind of brought it back to the va'a of like, okay, I'm on a canoe and my sails, my um, hala sails, they've got rips in them. And, you know, we got to, uh, we got to put more sealant on the, on the va'a, like, you know, we're, we're sailing and we're going to make it to Tahiti soon to get more supplies. So it's just kind of, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, culture of sustainability, believing in it, and then being committed to that mission. And, you know, little by little, it'll come as long as we, you know, keep it consistent. So beautiful. Everything that you folks share is, is so true, not only to, to farming and sustainability, but also to our society at large, right? And that's one of the things that I think is so important is finding the connectivity. And, and Mia talked about this earlier um, when we chatted, but she talked about how important it is to find the connectivity and the common threads that really will help guide us to, to a more resilient future. Um, and I think all of you folks touch on it. And when we talk about art as being that centerpiece, uh, I think it's so true because there is no there is no silver lining or silver bullet but we have to be able to continue to challenge and not only challenge systems or for society but challenge ourselves to keep to keep growing and to keep finding those common threads um i i just want to thank each and every one of you for the work that you are doing um in our community and and also the work that you're doing together i think it's it's truly an incredible opportunity when we're able to see brilliant minds um, mold and and shape a brighter, more inclusive and beautiful Hawaii that centers around the importance of culture and agriculture and being able to sustain ourselves just as our ancestors had years and years and years ago. Um, so thank you again for just for all of your hard work and I will check the chat if there's anything else in here. Um, I don't see anything else. Mina, did you have any last remarks that you wanted to give or Miho, you as well? No, I, I mean, it's, it's beautiful that it is systemic, but I just start thinking of, of, you know, personally, what can I do within my power and it, and I think one of the things through the mill, through our network is, is really sharing why it's so important to buy local produce when I mean, we're all buying food. You know, we all have this choice on what we're buying. Yeah, am I gonna buy a potato or I'm gonna get that ulu? Like make people aware of, of our own, you know, empower people to, to recognize these, these decisions that we get to make in our own lives. Um, and, and it is an economic decision too. I mean, the, I was I was looking at before this panel. I was looking at some of the 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 um, language that people use when they're talking about food sustainability. And then you get into food justice, food injustice, and then you get into all of these different realms of, you know, what we're doing with our land, how we're feeding ourselves, who's getting discriminated, you know, but. Um, you know, ultimately, I think it's how we empower power people, and and also to encourage youth to, hey, you want to be a farmer? That's a beautiful thing. You know, like what Noah was saying of of, no, the 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 land is is we're serving the land. We're really here to take care of the land. So, you know, in in my view of of the education system, it's. It's how do we make it fair for everyone who wants to become a lawyer can go have the opportunity to be a lawyer. What about everybody who wants to be a farmer? Why don't they get the opportunity to, to take care of land, you know, so that there's a, I don't want to say equity, but, you know, there's, there's opportunities that are for people who obviously we all have different gifts, different interests. So, um, that reminder of the systemic um, opportunities that we have, I don't call them challenges, but the opportunities and, and what can I do, you know, through, through my work and interests. So, um, sorry, it's not a, really a question, but uh, Miho, no, Janae. <laughs> it's a beautiful statement. 
that's one uh. of the things that we need to we need to bring in and just that that thought in itself to question because i mean we provide pathways and opportunities for our youth but in certain areas like kona, kona in particular i think in more rural areas we don't provide those same opportunities to our youth and as you talked about every single person has something that they are passionate about or that they are wonderful at like you never know if someone could be the um superstar artist or the next um farmer that can literally cultivate plants that help us help us really just change our entire society and the way we eat and the way we live um so i think like you talked about just i think that's one of the those silver linings and that middle thread is going back to education and allowing Keiki to become the innovators of tomorrow and giving them every opportunity to do so, especially when it comes to agriculture and preserving our land and looking at our history. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So, Miho, did you have any final remarks? Well, on the note, on the uh, comment that uh, Noah Lincoln stated, I'm really curious as to how art can continue to be part of this conversation. I think that, um, you know, I think art has the power to change perception or give new perspective. And I think that's also in the way that we live and make decisions on our life. And um, I hope that we can continue to have more of these conversations. I hope to visit the kitchen. I hope to um, connect with Noah and visit the Ulu farm and um, yeah, and I don't know, see how, the, how all these things bridge together. Um, I also know that um, Noah Lincoln right now is actually putting some uh, website links. I think Heidi asked a question about, is there um, a resource available for all the things that we've been talking story about? Uh, so there's some good links there, I think also Michael put in the link to his kitchen. So if you want to get to know a little bit more about that. Um, but does anybody have any final questions before we say mahalo to our wonderful guests and also to Janae, who's been doing a great job monitoring this evening. Um, please feel like, I, I feel like you guys can unmute it. You know, we have just a couple more minutes, so. Everybody's good. Um, <laughs> oh, or you can all unmute and say mahalo, good evening. I want to get to know more of you. Thank you. Last comments. <laughs> hey, mahalo. Yes, hey, Maya. Mahalo. Yes. I don't know. I, I think I must have missed about a half of the whole thing because the internet was, it was going in and out. And I'm not sure if it was you guys or if it was my my internet alone <laughs> but i mean it's certainly very interesting you know and you know and i think the problem is also the um our weather uh, uh situation has been somewhat changeable and i mean as i said before i mentioned it somewhere that uh, we had a record uh year of rain I think it hasn't been like this for 30 plus years where I live. That's in, it's on 2100 and Captain Cook, you know. So um, I've been overwhelmed by weeds, you know, jungle, you know. So, and all uh, my strength is trying to actually manage the jungle, try and push the jungle back and get rid of uh, some of the invasive stuff. But um, I'm not sure if I'm going to manage. <laughs> but mahalo for all this. It's very, very interesting. And I loved it. And I've been to Amy Greenwell quite a lot. And I mean, I'm, in, I'm a little higher from there, but in that vicinity. Yeah. Oh, yay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our guests, um, Michael and Anissa. And Noah, thank you all very much for joining us. And thank you once again to the Donkey Mill Art Center for coordinating an opportunity for us to share our ideas um, and to help move Hawaii forward. Um, once again, putting art at the center of, I guess, how we shape our society and where we go from here. So 
Um, don't forget, you can also visit their new um, exhibit. So I'm looking forward to going. I hope I see you folks there. Awesome. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Mahalo. Good night, everyone. Ahoy ho. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you.